fifth episode in a series about Wood Gaylor, whose work is the subject of the traveling exhibition from the Fleming Museum, Let's Have a Ball. The exhibition revives the work of a forgotten American modernist. I'm Alice Boone, Curator of Education and Public Programs at the Fleming Museum. And I'm Andrea Rosen, the Curator. We're starting in a slightly different place today as we pair Gaylor's work with that of Florian Stettheimer, another American modernist whose work has been revived in recent years and whose painting style and subject of the New York art scene overlaps with Gaylor's in some interesting ways. As we look at the two artists' busy spectacles and more intimate portraiture, we'll consider how the composition and flat, spectacular style of these paintings gives us a way of understanding how these paintings construct American identities in public life during the 1920s and 30s. Who was Florine Stettheimer, and what do we learn from considering her life and career with Gaylor's? Stettheimer was a painter, poet, and theatrical designer in New York in the early 20th century. She was from a wealthy family and often playfully collaborated with her two sisters and became close with an elite social circle of artists that included luminaries such as Marcel Duchamp and Gertrude Stein. Stettheimer and Gaylor were working at the same time and even showed in some of the same exhibitions. I have no evidence that they knew each other, though there was some overlap in their social circles. Yet Stettheimer generally occupied a wealthier and more refined milieu than Gaylor did. And artistically, the two artists did something similar. In their paintings, they depicted and mythologized their artistic social circles at play in flattened styles that consciously employed a kind of naive, fantastical approach to color and the depiction of space. In their combination of style and subject matter, both Gaylor and Stettheimer are what I call insider-outsiders. Despite their social integration into the art world, their unique styles distinguish them from their artistic colleagues. To start, we can look at Stedheimer's painting, Asbury Park South. It depicts a July 4th celebration in 1920 at Asbury Park in New Jersey. Among a swirl of lithe and fashionable black beachgoers, Stedheimer has included depictions of herself, Duchamp, and the photographer Carl Van Vechten. The background is completely yellow, which somewhat collapses the distinctions between the boardwalk, the sand, and the water. And the bodies kind of float flatly in the space like paper dolls on a table. Asbury Park has long been a place for spectacle and performance, and more pointedly, it was a contested space uh, through the Reconstruction and Jim Crow restrictions on where black and white beachgoers, beachgoers could spend time. Through the 1920s, there were protests there to integrate the beach. Stedheimer and Van Vechten are visiting the segregated south section in this scene. It makes me think about how being in public, taking up space, and having unharassed leisure time is a contested activity. Everyone here is self-contained and aware of watching each other as they model fashion or play games. They're not paying attention to Van Vechten and Stedheimer as onlookers or voyeurs of the scene. Van Vechten moved between white and black social circles as a photographer during the Harlem Renaissance and took some iconic images of that scene. You see him here looking like a photographer, almost composing these figures into poses with his gaze. You see Stettheimer doing the same thing with her artist's gaze, like we're seeing an assemblage of so many individual moments of fashion, conversation, and dancing all flattened into the busy scene. It feels like it draws the viewer in to consider their own perspective as an outsider in the scene, a voyeur looking in at all these figures from a distance of space and time. And we could compare it to Gaylor's own flattened spectacles of bodies crowded into space, for example, in KHM's birthday party. It's also a primarily yellow painting. It also divides the party goers into different levels and spaces, both within the department depicted and in terms of the space of the painting. This painting depicts a birthday party for the artist Kenneth Hayes Miller in 1933. Miller had taught Wood Gaylor's wife Adelaide and many of their artist friends at the Art Students League in the teens. We see Miller seated at right, Wood and Adelaide Gaylor seated at left, and the central dancing couple are the artists Reginald Marsh and Isabel Bishop. And everyone's watching them. There's that voyeurism again. 
The party was held at the apartment of Charles Student, a lawyer with many artist friends, as evidenced by the artworks decorating his space. He was also a board member of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. It's notable then that despite his involvement with an important civil rights group, the party is a sea of white faces. It's interesting that the who's who is an important part of looking at both of these paintings. Here's Marcel Duchamp, here's Reginald Marsh. Identifying famous figures is familiar as a way of understanding these artworks and their historical value. But there's also something crucial about studying who's left out, who's objectified, who's anonymous. Taken together, the elevation of some figures and the exclusion of others help us think about how these art scenes function socially. And we could look at a few more Gaylor paintings like HEF Auction or Union Square Fire Brigade in which there are black figures, but they're off to the side. They are a band hired to perform, but shunted into a corner or a niche. Looking at all of these paintings together lets us see some of the ways that these celebrations and parties helped artistic social groups build their identity and solidify it, both through their celebration of the arts, but also through their separation and distinction from others. These paintings physically show those divisions between insider white artists and outsider black performances. It's two different kinds of performances. The black bands who are to be consumed and anonymous on the sidelines as outsiders, and then the other performance is about performing for your friends in a clever or outlandish way, celebrating your insideriness. Those performances and costumes often involve ethnic dress up, um, what do you make of these skits and costumes? We often see in Gaylor scenes presumably white party guests wearing racialized costumes. There are certainly examples in Arts Ball 1918, for instance, of party goers in Native American costumes, in Middle Eastern costumes. And in fact, many of the balls that the Penguin and its precursor, the Kit Kat Club, threw had racialized themes that exoticized non white cultures, a dream of the Orient. King Herod's Court, Fete Day in a Spanish-American Village. The program for a 1918 dance concert at the Penguin lists a performance of Gollywog's Cakewalk, also known as the Children's Corner by Claude Debussy. That song and its accompanying image of a grotesque children's blackface toy was part of a European and American fascination with minstrelsy. It looks from the program like the song was performed by Japanese artists and performers, which makes me want to know more about it. These performances aren't unique to the Penguin, the Kit Kat Club, or Gaylor's uh, New York scene. Fraternal organizations, social clubs, artist groups, sports teams, and other social groups in the 19th and 20th century drew from minstrelsy, or exoticize Asian characters, or appropriate Native American props and imagery to build their own sense of social camaraderie, to build their sense of their whiteness. We've been talking about identity formation in these big group scenes where you see almost a social identity more than an individual one. How do Stettheimer and Gaylor explore these issues in portraits which have a more intimate form of performance? We can see Stettheimer playing with the idea of skin color as a performance in a portrait in the Fleming's own collection uh, of her friend, Louis Bernheimer. Uh, while painting this portrait, Louis was vac on vacation in Nantucket and Stettheimer sent him a postcard asking him teasingly to indicate the shade of his summer tan in order for her to complete the painting. Just like the artist performing in brown face, Bernheimer had the luxury of donning a darker skin tone temporarily without suffering the social consequences because of his whiteness and his class privilege indicated in the painting by his tailored summer suit and the fine decor in the background. In fact, when Lewis responded to Florine's card, it was apparent he didn't know that she was planning to paint his portrait. So he probably didn't sit for it in person. So perhaps the performance is more Stedheimer's than Bernheimer's. That's interesting. What about Wood Gaylor, whose talents seem to be more oriented toward groups than portraits? Gaylor occasionally painted portraits of friends, often in watercolor. So it's interesting what one of the few portraits in oil that we found is of a black celebrity, a somber portrayal of the boxer Jack Johnson the first African-American world heavyweight boxing champion in 1908. 
his position made him one of the most famous black celebrities of his era, and he suffered the associated consequences of being a famous black man in a racist society. Specifically, he went to prison in 1920 on trumped up charges based on his controversial relationships and marriages to white women. It's unlikely that Johnson sat for this portrait or even knew that Gaylor did it. As a celebrity, particularly a black celebrity, Johnson had little power to control his own images or the way it was interpreted. Gaylor depicts him as a melancholy figure in this painting from 1917. He seems to have placed Johnson in the boxing ring, yet his attire seems to be a glamorous coat and hat rather than his boxing regalia, perhaps referring to the trappings of his celebrity. The close-up format allows Gaylor to really focus on the facial expression in a way that he seldom does. It's such an unusual image for him that one has to speculate on what it was about Jack Johnson that inspired Gaylor to make this departure. So for Gaylor, even the portraits have these qualities of performance. And that makes sense because St Stettheimer and Gaylor each move back and forth professionally from the three-dimensional stage to the flat painting. And it draws out that paper doll quality you talked about earlier. Right. It's so interesting that Gaylor and Stettheimer both worked in fashion, um, him through his dress pattern work, her through costume. They both worked in theater uh, through the Penguin skits um, for him or for her um, in creating the costumes for the Stein opera Four Scenes in Three Acts. Um, so we can think about their paintings as another expression of their interest in fashion. Look at the fabulous outfits being paraded in Asbury Park South and KHM's birthday party. You can also think about the way that um, the three-dimensional art of fashion gets flattened into that two-dimensional presentation in the paintings. And then that is one way of idealizing it, like a department store window does. In fact, it's an interesting tidbit that Stedheimer and Gehler both exhibited their work in a modern art gallery that was set up within Wanamaker's department store, where visitors could shop for fashion and art at the same time, both products that could help them envision and manifest an idealized lifestyle. Louis Boucher uh, was an artist and mutual acquaintance of Stettheimer and Gaylor, and he curated that gallery and put their work into those shows. We see an interesting depiction of Boucher in Stettheimer's portrait of him. It's interesting, she staged him with these lace curtains that are enveloping him and these props that are surrounding him as though he himself were in the department store window on display as a stylish, stylized figure. I'm curious as to who you think is most on display here. Is it Stettheimer and her hyper feminine style or is it Boucher, the subject of the painting? I think by asking the question, the answer is pretty clear. And I think that's one of the facets of Stettheimer's work that has really drawn in artists and scholars over the years, especially recently. For her to have such an uncompromisingly hyper-feminine style in a male-dominated world seems refreshing even now. What we see in all of these paintings is that sense of playing dress-up as a way of trying on identities. When you're an art insider, the world's your stage. You can control your own performances, because you can depict them. As scholars have shown in other studies of how photography and caricature of black bodies circulated in the early 20th century, when you're an outsider like Jack Johnson or perhaps like those figures in Asbury Park South, that control over how your image circulates is far more fraught. You are the spectacle rather than you're controlling or framing the spectacle. You started this project thinking about Gaylor as an insider-outsider. How have your ideas changed as you have considered him through these new lenses? My initial draw to Gaylor's work were the, the stories he has to tell, those wacky costume balls and skits that his social circle of artists mounted. Um, this circle of artists who are celebrated in art history for pioneering a distinctly American modernism. By focusing on the margins, the black band in the corner, the racialized costumes in the background, we realize that many artists at the time and most art historians since define that Americanness very narrowly. As we look at Gaylor's paintings and the ephemera that surround it, archival photographs and programs, his memoir, 
we have to consider that these stories were told a certain way for a reason, to solidify a particular kind of artistic identity. When we look at the negative spaces cut around the figures that are Gaylor's focus, we see alternate American art histories of popular culture, performance, public art, and folk art start to take shape. Thank you.